Sharia rules pertaining to the protection and safeguarding of the rights of the orphans and those who are vulnerable in society, protection of the property of the person who is insane, the rules of inheritance and states on the positive side. But again, it remains a slogan unless there is an enforcement mechanism that punishes those who aggress against the right to wealth of others, which is legitimate as well. The third point on that issue of so-called incompatibility is that <coughs> some people would say that Islamic Sharia encroaches on personal freedoms. We can understand if Sharia has punishments pertaining to various crimes like murder or theft or whatnot. But why encroach on personal freedom by having even a codified or specific punishment for drinking or adultery or fornication, if it is not rape, if it is no force is used, if it's consensual. And this kind of questions and reservation that you hear from the West is resulting from the corrupt status quo, that drinking is totally a personal matter, consensual sex outside of marriage is totally a personal freedom. Nobody has any right to interfere or like uh, Pierre Trudeau say, the government has no place in bedrooms, in people's bedrooms. But to say that, if they want to speak about that from secular perspective, that's their right. But Muslims have their human rights as well also to believe in their faith. And to believe according to the two primary sources of Islam that these are not totally individual ills or aberrations. They threaten the whole society and its well-being as well, long term. And mind you, if a person commit that without being caught, without declaring it, even he might get away with it. If a Muslim even is drinking in privacy and he's not caught, nobody would snoop on him or not su supposed to snoop on him, no. But the punishment here is when these things become a norm in society, become publicized. That's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إن الذين يحبون أن تشيع الفاحشة في الذين آمنوا لهم عذاب أليم في الدنيا والآخرة. Those who wish to spread evil and abomination within the Muslim community, they have severe punishment in this life and the hereafter. So again, don't you try to squeeze Islam in a secular frame of reference, we tell them. The fourth point. Some people say, all right, maybe some of the aspect of your Sharia Actually, it's a sharia of Allah, but that's the way I put it. Some aspect of your sharia might somehow be compatible, at least some, with Western laws, the modern, advanced, civilized laws. But whenever there is any conflict between your sharia and universally accepted principles in international law or human rights declarations and all of that, you should comply with it because that supersedes any particular nation. The biggest mistake to start with, Islam is not a nation. Islam is not a nation limited by boundaries. Islam is an ummah that includes every person who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And whenever there is any group who have a government like we have today, for example, that tries or intends to apply Islamic law, they're not the ummah, they're part of that ummah. So it is nonsense to speak about the national law that goes across national boundaries. The ummah of Islam has no boundaries. Secondly, to make that statement, and you must have seen those kind of demands made by non-Muslims, to say that in the name of human rights, is in itself a violation of, using even their term, the human rights of Muslims. Why is that? If human rights, even in the internationally known concept, means that you believe what you believe in, you worship Allah the way you want to worship, right? For the Muslim, it is part of belief and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to implement his law. So to say, in the name of human rights, forget about your Islamic human rights, 
the right to implement your deen is a glaring contradiction that very few people, people stop to see the contradiction. A second point, let us ask those who say this, what is really meant by universality? Universality of certain rights or protections or safeguards. To start with, and to be fair, I do not disagree that there may be some basic concepts and ideas in international conventions and international human rights legislations and so on that a Muslim have absolutely no problem with and really you can admit they are universal in one sense. Example, that the person is innocent until proven otherwise, that they have to be due process of law, that a person who is in trouble legally has the right for counsel and defense, that there should be some appeal mechanism, if, and especially in some serious kind of accusation. A Muslim has absolutely no problem with this universal rights and guarantees because they have been inherent in Islamic Sharia long time before they were codified in Western laws. It's not a problem. But to use that in a very simplistic and naive way to say that everything that uh, universal declaration of human rights and others is really universal among all people is really misleading. I'll give you just one example. Remember that huge debate that took place in the United Nations sponsored population conference in Cairo about the definition of the family, the kind of definitions or new definitions of family that has been pushed on the throats of some people. Was that really universal? There were lots of people, there were lots of loud voices that were supporting that. But there were a lot of opposition as well, not only from Muslims, as you know. The Vatican stood against that, and many countries with a strong Catholic presence objected to that as well. By what right, then, can we say that this is universal? By voting? And what happened in voting in this kind of international forums? I have been in some of them. I've been in one in, uh, in Austria at one time. And I've seen what goes on. While it appears to be all democratic and open, the reality is that those who set the agenda and organize it are the ones who have the loudest voice. There are certain groups, mostly secular groups, that dominate the agenda. So how do you determine by a majority vote that this is really universal and should be binding on all nations? Otherwise, they would be subjected to pressures and sanctions and all kind of stuff. This is the new imperialism. A third point. Even if you apply this so-called universal declaration that the West thinks in its ethnocentrism that they are the ones really who are so advanced and introducing it to the rest of the backward world, the third world and second world and fourth world, however they classify them. Let us look even at one example of the most advanced Western country in the world, the, so the only remaining so-called superpower and I'm saying only in material sense. Only in material sense. Are you aware of the debates about capital punishment? Are you aware that there are some states like Texas that allows for capital punishment? What do other international organizations say about it? Amnesty International, what does it say about capital punishment? It is an inhuman and unduly cruel punishment. Yet the most advanced country is implementing that in many states. And it's not only the governments. It's not only the governments. You know that when they make uh, surveys, they find that the opinion is somewhat divided in the United States, in some cases, even some countries in, in Europe, about whether capital punishment should be totally abolished or should it still be a applicable for cases like mass murderers and all of this, or killing policemen or federal officer or whatever. So how can we really come up with this fancy claim of universality that has been initiated by the advanced West that everybody else has to fall in line with? This is nothing short of arrogance. The bottom line then is that the issue of conformity, when we speak about conformity, that respect of religious freedom and religious freedom of Muslims, among others, 